Good morning and welcome to the first ever edition of uh, Blabbermouth, which, I mean, title pending. Are we sure that's going to be the title forever? I don't know. Uh, so far, I like it. But I feel like it might need to explain a bit more what the premise is. But in order to think of a word for that, we need to explain <laughs> what the show actually is. And I think, well, let me say, before we start with all of the uh, amazing, <laughs> do apologize, there's a dog in the background. Uh, before I start playing to you all the amazing voice notes I have received, Hank, would you lie down? <laughs> uh, I'm going to try and introduce my thought behind this. There are two aspects of this. Um, one aspect is that... Hank, is this the time to be playing? No, it's not. Uh, before the pandemic, <clears throat> uh, at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival that came right before it. Yeah. Lie down. Do apologize for the dog. Uh, before the pandemic. I uh, did a show at the Edinburgh Festival, which I do most years. Uh, all years, ideally, when there isn't a global pandemic. And I was feeling more and more uncomfortable with the people who came to my shows. Now, I thought it was because of the people, <laughs> and sure, let's say somewhere between 5 and 10% of them, absolutely the case. I don't take uh, any of the responsibility for the 5 to 10%. But the rest of them, what was scaring me was that I felt like, I felt uncomfortable with being, I felt like I was being given so much um, responsibility and uh, I felt like I was being held up to a very high standard that I 1000% could not live up to. So it made me very uncomfortable. I would, <laughs> every day when I left the venue, I would try and go in a, uh, in a direction that uh, where the people wouldn't be. When I did meet people in the street, I was immediately very um, and anxious and just wanted to get out of there and then the pandemic happened and suddenly I lost all my income and I was like I had to rely on people that who followed me to help me out and become patrons like like you are now and to yeah support my work and I was selling my book like uh, signing the books and sending them out and I ended up realizing that I'm not really, like, by 90% of you, I'm not being held up to an impossible standard. I am being seen as a human being. And actually, you're all pretty great. I started doing these Instagram Lives and quickly learned that so many of you are so incredibly passionate and intelligent and funny. And I don't know what I'd expected. Uh, I think it's more, almost like a reflection of what you think of yourself when you imagine who would like the stuff that you do. And I was really grateful to realize that, oh, people are actually really cool. <laughs> so during the pandemic, I felt like I got to know you. Uh, and that is one aspect which is very important for what this is. Like, this is about connecting with each other. It's about community and... It's about something that I, it probably exists as a word, but like I haven't looked it up. What I'm thinking of this as being is like a micro internet. So, because that's the second aspect is the internet. <laughs> we, we grew up, I, don't, I mean, again, I don't know what age you all are, what the age the majority of you are. But like, I was a teenager when the internet came and so I remember a time before it and I remember thinking it was amazing. I remember getting Facebook for the first time, Twitter, Instagram, and I was immediately like incredibly aggressive. Like the second I was 
getting into more activist stuff. I was getting incredibly aggressive, uh, very fighty, very... Um, like if this had been now in the in the history if i'd still if i'd been 26 7 8 now i would have been like calling people out very aggressively and i was super performative in my allyship and my activism and and i guess that is now something that i am that is not how i do things that's not how i do things anymore um, I now feel like if we need to get anywhere, and I think maybe something about that is time, right? It's like having seen the same arguments and the same patterns again and again and again and again and again all over the internet and seeing people not change, you know, seeing just people get more and more radicalized to the right and respond to the sort of aggressive performative allyship in a very <laughs> negative way. That I think I was like, okay, so how do we do things? And I think the internet is very, <laughs> I think the internet is very big. Quote, quote me on that. You can quote me on that. I, I'm going to put it out, out there. I think the internet is big. So sue me. Um, I do think, <laughs> I wonder if the internet is, um, it's too big for me and it's too big for what I want to do. Because I want to... I want us to be more nuanced. I want the conversation to be more empathetic. And I want it to be dark and deep and raw and ugly and uncomfortable. But I want it to be within our space. That is not to say it's a safe space because we don't do safe spaces. But I like this. I like this. On an, an average Instagram live, I get somewhere between 70 and 150 viewers. Which is, in today's world, not a lot, right? At the moment of this uh, Sunday morning recording, there are, as far as I can see, 14 people watching, right? Which is also, in the grand scheme of things, not that many. But if we imagine it, instead of as a number, you know, on a screen, um, we imagine it as a people in the room. If you're all here with me, all 14 of you, or when it's like an average Instagram live, 100 people, that is when I feel like we can start to actually get things done and learn from each other. Because then it, then it doesn't become a screaming match to see who's right and who can like say the, the nicest thing. It's not about likes. It's about conversation. So that is my second aspect of this. So I just want us to have fun i want us to have conversations i um will be sharing some of your the comments that you you make um you are allowed to send voice notes during this as well if you go to sophiehagen.com forward slash blabbermouth you can send um uh, voice notes uh today i'll be having at least two guests on uh to come and have a little chat with me um, basically, the the options are endless. So, welcome to the show. And I am going to start by <laughs> uh, playing this... Ooh, which conversation do you want to start with? Well, first of all, before we start getting into one of the questions that we've received... Um, I'd like to make today's theme, if there is any, um, the internet. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the internet. I know that's like very broad, but I'd like to hear sort of what was your first experiences with the internet? Do you remember the first thing you went to look at on the internet? And do you remember why it was sex.com? And <laughs> I, went like, I went to sex.com and it asked for like your address and I just thought I didn't know anything. It was my first time on the internet. So I put in our address and then like nothing happened. I was like, fine, whatever. And then like a couple of weeks later, we received an invoice in the post from sex.com. And my mother was terrified. Like she didn't know anything about the internet either. So she like got my cousin to come who worked in IT. And my cousin was like looking at this and then she was like, oh, this is like just a 
it's just like a virus like it's not nothing's wrong just don't do anything and i thought i remember thinking <laughs> i fooled her <laughs> when in reality she was like i see what's happened here <laughs> i see what sophie's done and she managed to save me which was very nice so i would love to hear about your thoughts about the internet your thoughts about community within the internet um I mean, good things, bad things, experiencing experiences, things that you're wondering about, anything like that, I would love to hear from you. Um, so let us begin with a uh, yeah, this feels fairly oh yes. This seems like a very nice way to start this. It's not about the internet, but I will share uh, this message that we got from Amy. Hello, Sophie and Blabber Mouthers. Um, please excuse my voice, I've got a cold. So basically, my mum is the most wonderful woman in the world, lovely, would never want to hurt or offend anyone. But I have three nieces, for her three granddaughters, the oldest is 13, the youngest is four, and whenever she sees them, her main topics of conversation are how pretty they are, um, how lovely their clothes are, and how much better than they are they are than all of their friends, um, and obviously I find it a bit weird setting them up for some odd relationships with friends and girls and bodies in the future. Um, so I've said something before and said, you know, mum, maybe focus on something else, and she's kind of said get out of it it's not your relationship with them it's mine um and I don't know if she's right I mean should I say something or should I just keep my mouth shut thank you for your help love you bye thank you so much for that message Amy and congratulations on being the first ever voice message that we've received on blabbermouth title confirmation pending I think this is such an interesting question and I think it's a very good question and I think it's something that we all think about sometimes. I th I mean, I think the perfect world would be one where I could and would be allowed to control everyone's actions all the time. I feel like that would be a very nice world because I could make sure that everyone did the right thing all the time and I'm not saying that as like a, that's not me being sarcastic or like, ooh, you think you're going to control everyone, Amy? Absolutely not. I genuinely believe it. I genuinely believe that I should be able to control people's actions. But unfortunately, what we are told is that uh, we're not allowed to do that and we're unable to do that, which is incredibly annoying. I'd love to hear people's thoughts. So please share in the comments what you um, what you would tell Amy uh, as a reply to that question. I think personally, uh, I would... All you can really do, annoyingly, is inform your mother of... Or was it your grandmother? I do apologize. Um, inform her that of what it means, like what the consequences are of only focusing on this child's looks and um, how pretty she is and all of those things, like how it can affect her. And... I mean, once she has that information and she if she still wants to go with it, I'm afraid I think you just have to go in the opposite direction and just try and influence the fuck out of this child and just be like, talk about her abilities and her strengths and all of that. I think we sometimes underestimate how meaningful the things that we're told as children are. Like, I remember things that like an uncle that I only met once, like a thing he said, that like meant everything to me because no one had said that before. And I think sometimes the people who come, I think what our parents or like grandparents or those who are closest to us, I think what they say to us um, sticks in a very different way than like a stranger coming into our lives every once in a while and then leaving again. Um, you know, what our parents say is like drilled into us uh, based on, because, like how many times it's we, you know, it's something we're told every single day which is very different than someone comes in and like changes your life by saying like one sentence it's like a bit like teachers you ever had a teacher who said like one thing and you were like this is life-changing um so i think oh sorry that was the 
the sound of my coffee. Um, I would go all in. I once tried to um, to indoctrinate my little cousin or like step cousin or something like a little boy in my family because both of his parents were in the police and were <laughs> I want to say thus very racist and horrible and they were teaching him horrific things so me uh, and my other cousin like dragged him out of this family dinner and we were just like okay listen and we just explained everything that like the the truth of everything that he had been told by his parents and he was so shocked he was so shocked he was like what and then you know and that's the story of how i stopped being in touch with my dad's side of the family (laughs) but um i thought that was very important to do that and when i meet children (laughs) that are somewhat related to me and like my friend's kids i try to yeah, I try to put as many thoughts into that, into that as I possibly can. Uh, good thoughts, of course, positive thoughts about them being super worthy and amazing and beautiful and, well, beautiful if they're a boy, <laughs> talented if they're a girl. Anyways, we have got, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, we've got a comment here from Rachel Keats saying, I agree with this and in influencing the child, you could indirectly give your mother something to think about, which is an amazing point as well. Uh, I think it's it's easier to show what you mean sometimes it depends on how in particular this mother how this mother is learning right uh some of us can see the 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 uh, we, we can see how people react to what people around them do what a sentence also um I wonder if your mother has grown up only being told she's pretty and beautiful would it be a thought would it be interesting to try and uh, compliment your mother on her abilities just as a fun thing just to see how she'd react maybe she'd be like oh shit i see what this is <laughs> this feels really good there's just something about it isn't there like I- i'd love to hear from you people how you feel um when you are told that you are talented or uh, super able or um I'm trying to think of like the most interesting compliments I've ever received. Like weirdly, my uh, I had a lot of nice teachers saying nice things, and I remember one of the things we were all learning the computer. That's how old I am. We were like learning how a computer works because we were all just getting computers for the first time. So we were learning like how to type using the what was called the ten finger system, where you like, you have to have your hands on the keyboard and then you had to learn like which finger goes to what button. But at this point, I'd been typing for years and I was like super quick. But it wasn't the ten finger system; it was my own system. But it was quicker than anyone in my class. We were also at the same time learning um, the spell check in Microsoft Word and how to uh, to use that to like spell check. And I remember just like sitting there like typing and having one teacher come over and say, oh, no, your your finger has to go on the H instead of the blah, blah. Um, and then my other teacher came over and she just like leaned over and she turned off spell checker. And she was like, your brain is more accurate than this. Uh, so you have to ignore this. And also you do whatever the fuck you want with the keyboard. And it was I, I still think about it. And this is what I was like 12 <laughs> It's like, oh, I don't even want to think about it. 20, oh, 21 years ago. And that sticks in the same way as like a cousin that I hadn't, that I only met a few times um, said, I was starting a new school, like a boarding school thing. And he said uh, something along the lines of, oh, you'll never, she'll never finish that because she doesn't finish anything. Also, one comment that's, like, stuck forever. Anyways, tell me about your uh, compliments and things that you've received. Uh, We have got a comment here from Holly Ballew. As a mom of three, I've had to learn to let go a bit with how their relationships with other people are. Teaching the kids to think through what others say has been a lot more effective. 
this is what we want, Holly. We want the opinion of an, an actual parent who knows what it's like to be on the other side of this. Uh, my One of my best friends, her parenting style with her husband, like their, their parenting styles are incredibly different, like extremely different. And I see her like really try to like allow him to raise the child the way he wants to raise the child and like just and just do her own thing instead of trying to change his way of doing it and i couldn't do it i could not do it but it's very interesting to see and i do think there's definitely a a point in that we have got a comment now from jillian saying our bedtime stories were fun books full of confidence building body positivity inclusivity feminism etc to build up my kids ideas and counteract messages from in-laws and other outside sources very good idea very good idea uh i have uh there is a i think technically a kids book called um a i think it's called a for activism and it's like the the, the alphabet but like some of them is like u for unionizing you know it's like <laughs> deep diversity um and it's real fun because it's, it feels like it's definitely not a, a kid's book because it's like very big words but i bought that for my little what was he at the time two two-year-old uh nephew and it was really fun because like he just looked at the photos and like thought it was fun but then like eventually he started like now he can talk he must be four or something five maybe now who knows and um uh and now he's like asking about the words, even though he doesn't really understand them. He's like doing the, the, um, like all the the sort of the what the drawings do, like the the power symbols and stuff with his fist, and it's very beautiful. Saima says, "I don't remember anyone thinking I looked nice, as much as I remember my work friend listing my abilities to praise me twelve years ago." Saima, I'm curious, what were your abilities? I'm just really curious. I want to know. Uh, I think it's very interesting what we remember. Do you know? Like, oh, one second. Let me just double check. Okay, we're fine. Um, I think it's very interesting, like, what you remember. I have a weird... It's it, Well, it wasn't a compliment. It was a criticism. And the weird thing is, I don't remember what the criticism was, but I remember who said it, when they said it, where they said it, and how I felt. But it's almost like I just remember coming over to this booth where a bunch of people were sat, colleagues, and this uh, comedian said something. And I remember thinking, this hurts so much. And I remember thinking, this is going to change how I do this thing forever. <laughs> but I don't remember what the thing was, which is like, it's terrifying. It's like my brain was just like, nah, nope, we're not going there. Uh, we've got Amy... Uh, who uh, sent in the original voice, voice note uh, thanking everyone for their help. You're welcome, Amy. Thank you so much for sending in a voice note. Holly says, uh, Haha, I have a lot more expectations and conversations with my partner than I do other people. I'm assuming we're, talk we're back to talking about parenting, uh, which is a topic that I'm not even going to get into. I mean, we will. We'll get into everything. But in terms of what I feel like I can talk on, I don't think parenting is, is it. Let us do, well, speaking of Holly, let us listen to what Holly has sent in. My absolute dream is to write fantasy books that have a wide cast of characters, including fat people being awesome. But I see so much of I hate this or don't do this when it comes to describing fat characters, plus still working on my own internalized fat phobia towards myself that it leaves me at a loss for how to do those descriptions well. So how would the fat people in the audience like to see ourselves represented in fiction? Thank you so much for that message, Holly. That is such a good question. Isn't it? Isn't that a good question? Bef uh, I'll let you all write in the comments what you think. I'm going to... I'm going to tell you what it reminds me of. Um, I'm currently speaking to my friend about, well, in the past couple of days, we've been talking a lot about fet fetishization. Um, oh, I'm going to try and make 
I think the light outside just got a lot brighter, so I'm just gonna try and readjust this light while I talk, which is complicated. Hmm. Okay, we'll take we'll just accept this. Um and we were talking about fetishization and how there are these two uh ways of looking at fetishization fetishization, which is usually something that you only use about someone in like a minority or someone in a in a uh, discriminate, discriminated against body type or whatever and so there's one side which is like yeah uh, because you don't see these people as humans so like you're, you're fetishizing them and that's bad then there's the aspect that is like why is it a fetish just because you have a preference like if you preferred or was attracted to tall blonde thin cis women no one would ever say that that was a fetish, even though that's exclusively what you go for and, and that's the only porn you see, etc. No one would call you a fetishist because of that. So why do you do it when it's a fat person? Um, you know, there's like a thing where you go like, why, why, does, why am I a fetish all of a sudden? But then there's also the aspect where people who are, for example, fat, because that's what I can talk on, uh, feel fetishized because of the way they are treated. And everything it boiled down to for me was how do you and this is what makes it relevant to what you just said uh or to what you you asked holly because there is stigma attached to a thing about you you know your body your the, the gender the color of your skin whatever it is can you ever be neutral right because i was thinking a lot about um there was a scene in this film with, I'm going to say Rebel Wilson. I think it was a film called How to Be Single. I'm not 100% sure. Where she's out in a club and she's dancing with all these men. And they're all like conventionally attractive. And then the next morning, she uh, and for those of you who don't know, Rebel Wilson is or was at least at this point fat. She wakes up having had a one night stand. And the guy she's had a one night stand with was fat. And I, <laughs> I had two reactions at the same time. One was... Yay! A hot fat guy. We don't get to see like fat people have sex. This is amazing. Yes. And the other aspect of me was like, why couldn't she have slept with one of the conventionally attractive ones? Like that's what I want to see. And I was like, wow, I want to see both things at the same time. And it all boils down to the fact that this isn't a neutral thing. It's not neutral. How can you be neutral? Because regardless of what choice these filmmakers make, it's th th an aspect of it is going to be wrong in some in some way. So. That is a long-winded way of saying I actually don't know. <laughs> but um, we have got a comment here from Jennifer Sutton. I think using the word fat to describe the characters uh, rather than plus-sized or curvy is a really great start. That's a very good point. Um, I can also recommend that you read um, Bethany Rutter, actually. Um, uh Bethany Ratter has written a bunch of fiction books um, in which there are fat people in them, in the fiction books. And um, I, she's curvy, chubby, plus sized, whatever herself. So I'm very certain that she uses the, 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 the comfortable words around them. Uh, also, Saray Walker, uh, who wrote Diet Land and... Oh, of course, Dumplin, written by Ju no, Julie. Ah, that Google Dumplin. Um, then we've got Simon Nisbet saying, "When I read, I imagine thin people as the characters." <gasps> That's so true. If no one describes their body, body descriptions kind of annoy me sometimes. When they feel unnecessary or too much, fine lines do it well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's going to happen now is I'm just going to uh, send a message to Bethany. Would you want to come on my live show as a guest uh, within the next hour and talk about fat representation in your books? Um, we've had a question about how to write fat characters and we'd love to hear from you. 
let's see if Bethany Riley gets back to us because that would be a very interesting guest to have at this point. Uh, so, Simon, this is very interesting. I've sometimes read, it's also like, so then you read some a description of a fat body, but it's described um, positively. And that's when you go, oh, is this like a fetishization? Like, ugh, why are you fetishizing me? It is so tricky. Um, and I also don't, Julie Murphy, thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Sutton has just reminded us that it was Julie Murphy who wrote Dumplin'. I knew it was something with Julie or Julia. So perfect. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, let's, oh, let me see. Um, Bethany just got back to us. Now would be good. <laughs> Send you a link. Um, it's video. Um, because this is something I don't actually know. I don't know the answer. I don't know if there is one right answer or if it's one of those things where it could be, it could be anything. We just, uh, while we wait for Bethany, uh, let's just briefly touch back on, um, the thing that Saima said about how she had received a compliment. Oh, sorry. I just said she, I just assumed. I'm sorry. Um, uh, the Simon was uh, told by a colleague 12 years ago that they had a lot of abilities. And these abilities were, uh, Simon says, that I was good at problem solving, communicating, I was smart, and I could do any job. <sighs> I can imagine being told that, right? That's so good. That feels so good. I love that. We've also got... Okay, I'm just going to send the link... Amazing. Join here when you're ready. This is like normal people would have a producer to do these sorts of things, but you're going to have to bear with me. Um, <clears throat> we then have a comment here from Amy, who sent in the original message about um, her mother com commenting on this child's looks. Amy says, I think it worries me as she, her mother, Raised me the same. All comments about my appearance and competition with other girls and it's taken a lot of unlearning in adulthood. I mean, I don't know your mother, but is that something to tell her? Do you think that would help to say, the reason I'm asking you not to do this, mom, is that it really screwed with my head. Like, I can tell you exactly how it's going to affect her because it really affected me. I mean, that's a first-hand account, isn't it? Like, you should... You would assume that that would... <laughs> You, you'd you like to assume that that would uh, make a difference, wouldn't you? But of course, we also know that mothers are... Yeah. Uh, we're back now to the fat bodies in fiction. Harley says, that's the thing, isn't it? That the default is white, thin, etc. If you don't specify something else. Exactly. Exactly. There is someone who did... Um... Oh, it's very rude to do someone else's joke. But basically, I think it's Phil Wang, comedian Phil Wang, who did a joke where he references a friend. And then he references the eth ethnicity of the friend. And then he says, that's not relevant to the story. But if I didn't tell you, you would have imagined him as white. And it's such a like, oh, yeah, I did moment. I'm like, of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. Uh, but then the question we, we are going to hopefully have Bethany Ratter answer us is um, how? How do we do this? How do we describe? Harley, I'd also love to know, are you already a writer? Have you already published something? Um, did you find yourself, like whenever, when I was writing when I was a teenager and a kid, I would write, um, like I wouldn't write about fat people. I would write about, like they'd all be thin and in an in inadverted commas, beautiful, right? It would all be, and you know, of course they were all like me, but they were basically me, but thin, right? Like, oh, brown hair, brown eyes, da, 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 da. like every single feature that I usually would have, except also thin, which I found, um, at, which is also another way of sort of, uh, <laughs> I don't know if thin washing is, is a real word. I don't think it is. Um, like when you build your own fantasy and you end up stepping further away from how you actually look. And I, I think that's part of what can 
give you this body dysmorphia if you just spend so much time thinking about yourself as being in a different body than your own. Simon has a comment. Simon says, even though I am brown, I imagine the characters as white, not like me when I am in their head whilst reading. Not like me. Ah, as white, not like me when I'm in their head whilst reading. Whoa. That has so many layers, doesn't it? There's a whole separate chat, which is an interesting, and I don't even know where to go with that, which is like, I don't think I envision people. I don't think I have images in my head when I read fiction. I think I have images of places. Like I remember, I, I'll i always place them in a room, like a house that I know. Like where it's like, he goes to the bathroom. I'll imagine going to the bathroom, like in the house. Weirdly, like, a school friend's house from like 1994. <laughs> I'm so old. <laughs> but um, I don't think I imagine the people. Huh. Interesting. Uh, we asked Holly if uh, Holly had written anything yet, if they were published or anything like that. And Holly said, no, it's a dream happening on the sides of my daily life at the moment. I think it's a beautiful dream. I'd love to hear more people t telling me what their dream is what's your dream your side hustle dream uh, i am uh, that would have been <laughs> a tiny trigger for me um a few weeks ago because i am currently working on a new book um and it's only at the point of being a book proposal um at the moment so it's like not no one's said they wanted to publish it yet but i felt very 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 uncreative uncreative creative less it's probably a better word for that, uh, which I would know if <laughs> I was an actual author. And um, But then, here's a fun tip if anyone's in the same boat. I started reading, and I've been told to read this for about 15 years, but I haven't done it till now. I am now reading Stephen King's book called On Writing, which is like, you know, it's, it's what people describe as like the book. Like that is the book you must, you must read. Um, if you are a writer or wanting to be a writer. Uh, we've got a comment from Saima saying, Haha, you're not old. I'm 44 and a half. <laughs> so that's not old either. <laughs> I, I, think, I don't think you can ever call yourself old if you still use uh, and a half after your age. I <laughs> Then we've got Rachel saying, I hope 44 isn't old because I'm 51. <laughs> oh my God. Wait, so you will have... How old am I? I'm 33. Uh, so ten. So you will have been in your late teens, 20s when the internet came. I mean, I feel like I'm asking people, like, what was it like growing up during the war? <laughs> um, I think it freaks me out because uh, a friend of mine has a teenage daughter. And <laughs> this is so painful. Um, my friend told her... Oh, Sophie does stand-up. And this teenager said, um, stand-up? Ooh, retro. So painful. <laughs> retro. Oh, dear. Uh, really makes me, uh... <laughs> this really makes me feel old. Um, Holly says, on writing, which is the Stephen King book about writing, is all over author tube." don't know what author tube is but i like i like the thought of that it's, i'm assuming that's youtube where authors talk um and then holly also asked did you like it i'm only in the very beginning of it yet so but it felt very inspiring like when i was i'm listening to it and he's uh narrating it himself and um i just kept posting it to go right which is a very nice sign and he's at the moment i don't know what this book is going to end up being but he's just talking about his childhood so he hasn't even really mentioned a lot about how to write a book yet but i still felt very there are some books that makes me want to write and this is one of them the other one is the one called maybe you should talk to someone i forget the name of the author i kind of want to say rachel but maybe that's just because we have rachel uh coming up now as a comment saying i was in my late 20s and that is when uh, the internet came. Can you imagine growing up without the internet? Oh, it's a whole thing. Uh, 
we uh, Holly said, uh, explains uh, AuthorTube as a YouTube channel by authors and inspiring authors. Very curious about this. Jennifer Sutton asks, Holly, Holly, would you be writing under your name here, which is Holly Ballew? Can I be mildly creepy and alerted for when you get published? Oh, oh, so you mean you would, Jennifer wants to set up a, um, like a Google alert so that you get a Google alert when Holly eventually gets published. Oh, I want us all to do that. That's such a good question. I also want that answer, Jennifer, very well. Uh, Simon says, yes, I had a computer. I had a home computer with no internet in the mid 1990s. And it was my uncle's old one. I only played solitaire on it and wrote my school essays on it. Do you remember discs? Oh, this is gonna be such a like, is anyone younger than me on this live stream? I feel like Bethany must be young. No, she's probably not. <laughs> Rachel says my children can't imagine it, which is growing up without internet. It feels, it. there will be a whole generation, like there'll be a whole generation What am I trying to say? I'm gonna say at one point there will be someone's like ancient grandmother who's like 90 something who will have grown up with the internet. Like all of us who never lived under the internet, we will die at some point. And then no one can ever, like, isn't that scary? Oh, we have got a comment now from Ursula. When I create characters for comics, I also always tend to draw average thin people. So even if it's kind of simpler to represent fat people with drawings, I still have to remind myself all the time. That is incredibly interesting. And Ursula, I think we do want to know where your comics are. Can we find them anywhere? Can we go see them? Because plug your, plug your shit, as they say. Ooh, I hope none of you have a, whew, a dog in the room that has just done a horrible fart, because that is very uncomfortable. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, um... Uh, I wonder, Ursula, when you do write comics or characters in comics, if you make them fat, would that, do you think that would somehow change the story or like people's perception of the story? Again, because of someone who's like non um, conventional or like non whatever standard, um, would people then be like, oh, how does this play into it? Like, is this a story about fatness? Which is, I guess, something that's like a general question to something we will ask Bethany uh, when Bethany comes, which should be any time now. Um, uh, Holly says, uh, I've been going back and forth with using a pen name, but maybe having your support will decide it for me. Holly, regardless of what name you want to go with, um, just let us know which one it is so we can all do Google alerts. Jennifer Sutton, I'm the same age as you, Sophie, but we only had one computer with internet when I was a kid, so I had to transfer all my fanfic updates back and forth to my non-internet computer on floppy disks. Oh, floppy disks. No one... No one will ever understand. <laughs> oh, we've, we've got a baby. We've got a baby. We've got Natasha Koya uh, saying, I'm definitely a baby here. Only 21 grew up with the internet. Natasha... Oh, we've got Bethany joining us now. Let me see if I can get this working. Uh, guess it's in the green room. Hi, Bethany. I'm going to transfer you in right now, I think. Now I'm going to put you on the other side of me. There we go. Hi, Bethany. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. That's okay. Sorry, I'm freshly bathed, so my hair's wet. I wouldn't normally turn up to a, a recording with wet hair, but thank you for having me. Stop bragging about having showered. She's bathed. <laughs> so good to see you. So what we're doing here, um, we've uh, had a question from someone who is an aspiring writer about, let me see if I can find, oh no, I can't find the comment because it was um, a sound message. Basically how, uh, how to write fat characters in a non-problematic way, I guess. So Bethany, can you first tell us a bit about the books you've written? 
So I have written, um, well, I've published three novels and one coffee table book, which is about um, plus size style from around the world. It's called Plus. And then I've written two adult, um, young adult novels called No Big Deal and Melt My Heart. And then I recently, like two weeks ago, my first adult novel came out, which is called Welcome to Your Life. Um, so, you know, I've done a bit of writing in my time. Um, yeah. Those are my books and they, they tend to all revolve around like plus size babes. And when you started writing uh, fiction about plus size babes, what were your initial thoughts about how to do that? I guess I didn't really think about it too much because it's really like the only thing I've ever known. So it didn't occur to me to not write a plus size character because I wouldn't really yeah, I don't know. I just feel like we're quite underrepresented in fiction anyway. Um, so it was, oh, there's my cat. Hello, Paddington. Um, so yeah, it, I felt like it just made sort of sense for me as a writer, but also as a story to tell. And was there anything that was Oh, what can you say like moved in you by doing this writing like was it cathartic was it did it change something for you personally and like your relationship with your body or the way you um, see yourself Paddington chill out he just wants to be near me all the time um sorry I'm just gonna let him make his way onto the window so no he's changed his mind um <laughs> So yeah, what I loved about writing um, fat characters was being able to like revisit stuff from my life and kind of go over it, like try and figure stuff out, like rehash feeling, you know, especially writing my YA novels. It was really interesting to like revisit things that happened to me or like ways I felt as a teenager. And oh, oh Paddington, you're so, he fell off the cushion. You just need to chill out. Um, yeah, so just to sort of revisit like things from my life and go over them like for better and for worse, like sometimes nice things that happened or sometimes like difficult things that happened or situations that I responded to in like a certain way that with hindsight, like I would have been better off to avoid or I don't know. Yeah, it was very, it wasn't necessarily like cathartic, but it was very like interesting and useful and yeah, interesting like psychologically. Um, Cause obviously like I'm not the same person now that I was when I was a teenager. Um, so yeah, just kind of thinking about my younger self and like with the knowledge that I have now as an adult, that was very interesting. So the person asking is called Holly and Holly was wondering how how to do this what would your advice be to Harley about how to write fat characters um I guess if you are fat then write in a way that feels truthful to you like if um you know when you've read books and there's been like a fat character and you've been like okay fine but like does is that does that seem real like I don't feel like that's a real person I feel like that's a trope I feel like that's someone who is fulfilling a purpose in this like story this isn't like a fully formed human because that's often the feeling that I get when I read because when you read like a a novel um the main character is like never fat if they're not written by a fat person but a fat character might pop up in the book and it's generally someone who performs like an obstructing role. So it will be like um, a security guard that won't let someone in somewhere or a nurse that won't let someone leave the hospital. Like it will be this kind of like, yeah, obstruction. And that's signified by the fact that they're fat. And like, um, so yeah, like, I think about, you know, characters that I've read that I'm like, this is not a real person. This is just like a function. So I guess my advice would be like, write a person, like write a, whether you're fat or thin, um, just write a person and they are also fat. Um, and if you are fat, like you have a wealth of experience to draw on. And if you're not fat, I guess just like read some books written by fat people and see how they deal with um, 
you know, writing fully formed, fleshed out characters who are fat. Um, yeah, I guess those would be my recommendations. We just have a question here from Saima asking, did you automatically write fat? Did you automatically write fat characters or deliberately? And how do you describe them to ensure they are seen as fat? I view characters as thin by default when reading. Interesting. And I don't blame you um, because they generally are. Um, I did. I did it both automatically and deliberately. So it was very much like an impulse, like it it wouldn't even occur to me to not make my characters fat because that's what I'm writing. I'm writing stories about like fat babes navigating the world. Um, so inherently they have to be fat in order for that story to be true and useful and interesting. Um, and yes, I do try and always describe them so that they are understood by the reader as fat. Um, or I put them in situations where it's obvious, like where, you know, it is relevant that they are fat. Um, I try to avoid giving like specific, um, like clothes sizes or anything like that, because I want people to just be able to like, imagine this person, however way they need to see them. Um, in the one I'm writing at the moment, I, ha I think I have put in like a reference to a size, but um you know just imagine them however you want however fat you want them to be in order for the story to make sense to you amazing and can i just as the the finishing question here because thank you so much for joining us and on such of short course. that's okay um what where names of your books where can we get them so you can buy so they're called plus which is the coffee table book of plus size style from around the world which came out in like 2018 then 2019, I published my debut novel, which was called No Big Deal. And that's for young adults, but adults love it too. And then my second young adult novel came out in 2020, which was called Melt My Heart. And then two weeks ago, I published Welcome to Your Life, which is my debut novel for adults. They are all available through all the usual channels. Um, so, and... I th as far as I know, I don't know where people listening are, but um, the adult novel Welcome to Your Life, um, that was like a UK and Commonwealth rights deal. So you should be able to get that quite easily in Australia, for example, or other Commonwealth countries. Um, but yeah, they're all available in like Waterstones, wherever you buy your books, you should be able to get any slash all of the aforementioned books. That is so cool. Congratulations on the new book, Bethany. Thank you. We'll get it and buy it and read it, listen to it. Is it audio as well? Audio, it's read by this amazing babe who I met at an event. She, They came to um, uh, a Waterstones event that I did for No Big Deal. And I was like, you're cool. And I sort of kept track of them ever since then. And then when we were casting um, the book, the audiobook I was like I would like Elle Potter to read it and my publishers were like okay cool we will do that for you and they did a great job so amazing. thank you Elle so it's available on audio wherever you get your audiobooks amazing thank you so much Bethany I'm gonna let you go have a wonderful Sunday bye have fun thank you for having me wasn't that cool uh we've got another guest coming up in just a second I'm just gonna um get to some of your comments that you've made uh, Harley says, my daughter loves to draw and I always ask her about adding people of different shapes, uh, same as not just doing binary characters, which is very interesting. I really like that. Um, also something that, again, we're back to the sort of mother, the mother questions. Um, <laughs> we just got to come here from Jessica Russ. Uh, this is in reference to um, us all being very old. Jessica says, my five-year-old daughter asks Google everything she wants to know. Uh, I told her that I used to use a search engine called Ask Jeeves, and she asked me if that was like the... I can't say it because I have one. Uh, her dad has. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, Man on Elin has added uh, Bethany Rudder's um, books to the to-read list. I can highly recommend that. So um, we've now got a guest who <laughs> I met under in interesting circumstances. I don't think I can say more than that. Um, 
who is just a really good friend of mine, who is a, what I think we now call a micro-influencer, uh, meaning that she gets um, to do more adverts than me, um, because she's apparently niche or whatever. And uh, yeah, let me see about how I can add her to add right, which is left, which is that one's right. There you are. Hi, Justine. Hi. Where, where are you right now? Oh, I can see me. Can you not see me? Oh, I can see you. I'm just wondering what's in the background. <laughs> oh, where am I? Oh, I'm at my mum's house. <laughs> this is my oh, mum's okay. office. <laughs> I was like, that doesn't look like the very uh, stylish, Instagrammable yeah. person that I know from <laughs> from Instagram. Yeah, it's not my aesthetic, but it's it's practical, so I'm here. <laughs> Justine, you you're a mother. Yes, yes, I am that. <laughs> and we have um, we've had some questions today. Uh, we've been talking about um, one of. One of the listeners, uh, one of the viewers, had uh, a situation with a parent who would only ever um, compliment a child on her looks and especially doing it in a very sort of, you're much more beautiful than all the other girls kind of way. Mm -hmm. So we've been trying to talk a bit about how to talk to kids, how to talk to our own parents about how to talk about bodies and and how to talk about um, like not just comp complimenting girls and their appearances but also talking about mm -hmm. abilities and talents and stuff like that um what's your approach to this good question um so my for context for people watching my daughter has just turned three literally a couple of days ago so very like early stages and just at the age now of starting to become aware of this stuff like around that sort of two three mark and you know and it is a total minefield so i have always been and I guess most people when they're about to go into parenthood have all these ideals of how they're going to approach these things. So, you know, I will always just tell her that she's brave and she's strong and she's smart and I'll never tell her that she's prettier than everyone else. And then you forget that they live in the wider context of the world and that you're not the only person they see. Um, I'm also co-parenting, I'm separated. So I have to deal with that dynamic of I'm not even always in control of what the parent is telling her. So it is... A really difficult one and um particularly with they go to a nursery school you've got almost no control over what they're being told outside of your own home and as much as i can give her the books and the you know the feminist things from the windows at waterstones you know you can do that but um you have to check yourself sometimes and so my approach is very much um not as strict as a lot of my friends are with it because I do find myself slipping into it. And obviously to me, she is the most beautiful thing in the world. And you do kind of go, oh, you're so pretty and you are so beautiful. And you do have to check yourself and kind of go, oh, um, yeah, you're also smart and brave. And I think something I'm really keen on because I know I'm not perfect at it is making sure that things like the media she consumes and the things she's exposed to, you know, are a lot better than I am. So, you know, she sits and scrolls my Instagram with me and stuff. I'm a very screen time parent i'm totally fine with it so you know i'm making sure she's watching the right films the right tv and if she's watching you know sees my friends on instagram and she asks questions total open and honesty total transparency and you know she kind of really encouraging things like she'll poke my belly and say mommy's belly is really squishy and soft and i'll say yes isn't that wonderful and when and you know not forcing a conversation with her because i think then if I was to say to her, you know, really kind of drill down a rhetoric of, you know, fat is wonderful and all these things, which obviously it is, and to me they are, if then she goes and repeats that at nursery, for example, I don't have control over how other people are going to react to that. So it's kind of, yeah, making sure that when she brings something up, being as open and honest, but I'm not going to force her to bring something up in other contexts that just aren't natural. Um, but yeah, that that's my approach, I think. Um, but yeah, making sure she's surrounded by the right things. You know, she's lucky in that all of the women in her life, pretty much, are, are lovely plus size. And, you know, she's surrounded by badass, tattooed, fat women constantly. And I'm like, yeah, she's she sees it all the time. She's going to be in the right place, I think. So basically, parenting is like super easy? Oh, it's so easy. Yeah, it's such a <laughs> breeze. I'm so awake right now. <laughs> Um, we were talking about um, our own experiences with being complimented as mm. children uh, and as, as adults as well. 
<clears throat> do you remember compliments that you've received that wasn't about the way you look? Like, are there any compliments that that stick out to you? Like, we've had some <clears throat> people being told by coworkers that they like could do any job and they're super good at their jobs and stuff like that. Like, do you have any um, memories that stick out? Mm, totally, yeah. I I was super lucky. And I'm not just saying this because she's in the other room. My parents were always, <laughs> you know, super encouraging. And I was always as a kid. I don't really remember being complimented on my looks. I was always complimented on being smart. Always um because I, I was a really obnoxiously smart kid <laughs> and you know it was, you know it was the total on gifted programs and a massive overachiever everything which i'm sure there's a whole minefield on how that affects how my life is now <laughs> but um yeah i've always you know always been told i could do anything and try anything and was always encouraged to try new hobbies and if i didn't like that i could try something else because i could do anything and um you know, that was, it was always, be, it was always about being smart and always being able to do things other kids could do and not be able to revise and still get the good grades. And my parents were always really complimentary of that. And yeah, it was always, you're so smart and you can do anything. And I think that's probably now why I change jobs every five minutes and <laughs> do whatever I want to do. But yeah. Um, you are somewhat engaged with at least local politics up in yeah. York. Yes. Yes, York what would be if you could what would be the first thing that you'd want to change in politics um i would um i'm going to give a bit of context just because not everyone knows how local politics is formed but um a lot of the times if you're in a tory safe seat for example what they'll do is they'll put what they call a paper candidate on so just like a young somebody who wants to get into politics who isn't really a credible candidate and put them on because uh, they've got absolutely no belief that, for example, the Labour Party could win in that area. And I would scrap that practice in a second. Um, yeah, that's the first thing I would do. That was way more complicated than I thought it would be. I hoped it was like, well, peace. But no, you said something actual political. An actual um, thing that could be changed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, we have a comment from Gillian saying, my mother-in-law is very unhappy with her body doing slimming well. And is talking about eating bad food, eating too much, how much he's lost, etc. I try to balance it, but it's stressful. Yeah, how do you cope with that? Like as a parent, Justine, just knowing that your child is being exposed it's to that. Be, yeah, it's going to be hard. And I know there's a lot of talk at the minute. There's um, I can't remember the actual name of the program, but the the national light weighing program for kids, where they measure how tall they are, and and she's going to school next year, and it, I know that's going to come up at some point. And it is, you know, I'm a classic people pleaser. I don't want to be the person that's going to be like, oh, I don't want her to do that. But it, you know, it's going to come up and I don't want her to have to be weighed. And um, I don't want her to be part of that. So I know that is, is going to become more of an issue at school because, you know, she, at the minute, she doesn't care. She doesn't really know what weight is. She, you know, she's not aware of it. She's probably downstairs eating an Easter egg as we speak. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, it's, I think school age is going to be a lot harder. And it is because it is tiring. We all know it's tiring. I've worked in offices and stuff and it is so tiring. And if that's in my own life, when it's then going to have to be in her life as well, it's going to be, you know, twice as much pressure. And all you can do is try to counteract it at home. Yeah. And all you, yeah, all you can do is try and counteract it at home and constant positive reinforcement. And, you know, the people that you do have control over. So, you know, have an open conversation with the school about it. Have an open conversation with her nursery school and, you know, she spends a lot of time with my mum and that's a conversation we have around her a lot around, you know, weight loss not being an issue. And my friends know that it's not something we discuss in front of her. And that that's a hard line for me. And I think, yeah, being open with your boundaries without making it a problem for everybody, because they will. And I know some people will maybe think that's a bit weird, but I think creating if she sees that it's a problem and I'm sort of being um not aggressive, but kind of, you know, bringing it up with people, you know, we don't talk about that in front of Josie, she's going to become more um, intrigued about it. So actually just, you know, soft boundaries, you know, this is, this, we don't talk about this. I do not envy you. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. Uh, Justine, where can people go and uh, follow you to uh, get more of your thoughts on life? And your um, you can follow me on Instagram at Justine Up North um that's kind of the only place i am i'm i'm on twitter but i post probably once every three months <laughs> the way you should do twitter thank yep. you so much for joining us justine uh, thank you for having me and have a lovely easter sunday
Oh, it's Easter Sunday. That makes sense. Okay. <laughs> we will. You too. Bye. Bye. Okay, I cut, I cut off Justine mid by, which is very rude of me. Um, just going to share some comments. We've got Jennifer Sutton saying, that is one of my favorite things to do with any random kids I meet, because almost all of them comment on how fat I am, and I get to say, yes, I am. I'm really soft and comfy. Would you like to feel? Which, uh, oh, and she follows up by, oh, they, Jennifer follows up by saying, and I let them press my belly or give me a hug. That is adorable and so cute and just, I love that so much. Um, I once uh, volunteered at this clothing bazaar. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. Um, it was like a charity thing for like save, save, I think it was like for save the children. But it was also like child fashion. I'm not sure what it was. Did I imagine it? Did it really happen? No one knows. Anyway, so there was a bunch of these like children who were also models and they had the worst parents I've ever encountered anywhere. Like it was horrible. Like I saw one mother say to her daughter, suck in your belly like we practiced at home. And I was just like, this is the worst thing in the whole world. And um, <laughs> one of these kids, uh, this is this is not like a good thing to do for the child, but I liked the revenge over the mother so i do apologize for this but one of the kids i was queuing for the cafeteria and one of the kids said uh why are you fat and the mother was of course like ah, oh no and i said oh it's just because i keep eating so many vegetables and the mother <laughs> the mother n nearly broke down um but i really like that was back i was very young at the time now i would handle it differently and be more like ah it's okay to be fat um jessica russ says if someone says my five-year-old is pretty she says she's also smart too love that i love that holly says how society at large sneaks messaging in is so hard with kids i've seen my seen with my kids that we have to actively counteract those messages even when we try to be aware of what they're consuming yeah yeah <laughs> Jillian says, I hadn't thought of asking my mother-in-law to not discuss weight loss in front of my daughter. A difficult conversation, but I will have to do it. Jillian, uh, when we do another one of these, I would love to hear how that goes, because that is that is the thing to do, and I'm very excited. Holly says, my kids loved cuddling with my soft belly, and it's made me love it more. I love that. Let us, so we have about 20 minutes left, so let us take another voice note from Caitlin. Hello everyone and hello Sophie. It is so nice to be watching you on this Sunday morning. Um, I'm sure you don't remember I gave you a Mars bar Easter egg in Belfast um, a good few years ago now um, but I'm a huge fan so it's lovely to be voice noting you. Um, I suppose I, hmm, I kind of just wanted to get some insights, insights, not the right word, insights, thoughts about um dating so i'm someone who for the past two years has been housebound due to disability and i know you kind of talked recently about consciously choosing to be alone and i don't know if i'm at that point yet where i feel like i'm ready to make that choice i have kind of always been a serial monogamist up until lockdowns happened and um i went through like a couple of the weren't even bad breakups just like breakups are always bad no matter what um but I suppose I'm really sick of apps <laughs> and because I'm not going out to meet people it's just really difficult so does anyone have any ideas <laughs> of I don't know either ways to be more happy on your own or ways to make people talk um I would even be open to having like a long distance relationship with someone or a long distance kind of chatty friendship could be something more thing. Um, but it's just been tough and it's been tough kind of being in this house. Um, not on my own. I live with my parents. I'm very lucky, but not having that kind of romantic, physical connection for a couple of years. But any hints, tips, trips, trips? Cannot speak today. Uh, tips would be most welcome. And I hope you're all having a wonderful Sunday. Uh, did I end this? Bye! That's the perfect way to end that, Caitlin. That is such a good question. Um, and I love that it's sort of two-part. 
that it's like either how to be happy alone or how to like find a relationship that's nice. <laughs> uh that's exactly what we should be wanting right instead of just any relationship with anyone just because we need that or we feel like we need it first i want to say that the physical contact thing is definitely definitely a thing i talked with my therapist one of my therapists about it recently about um like how <laughs> how little i have been touched in the past couple of years and like particular like I've not been home, so and you know I haven't been seeing um, quite like any almost any friends physically, so there hasn't been a lot of just physical touch. And if I hadn't had my dog, if I hadn't had Hank, I I mean, which is not the same as it doesn't feel the same as like human physical thought touch, but it is a bit. And it's like you know he lies up against me in bed like back to back, so like that does feel a bit like someone's there <laughs> i think that might be the saddest thing i've ever said but you know what i mean and physical touch deprivation is definitely a thing so that doesn't have to mean that you're like desperate for a relationship that can also be a thing on its own and i think it's important to acknowledge that um of course we're open in the comments for people um giving their input i have found myself <laughs> Do you know when you do something and like you're not aware of why you do it, but you just know that it's something that you do? And I'm just realizing now that it's something I do. I think when I go grocery shopping, I feel like that's like my time to shine. And I've not thought this out loud before. I've just been doing it, I think. Um, also I am struggling. I mean, for people looking at this, they can tell that now the sun... That's one thing that I couldn't test before this is uh, where the sun would be at 1116, which is right in my face. So <laughs> I have done my new living room setup here. So <laughs> too late. We don't have time for me to move all the way around. And for people listening, this is not going to be interesting. But um, just to let you know, that's why I'm like moving back and forth a lot. So um, <laughs> what, I, what I have done is... I like getting a bit dressed up for grocery shopping, but not dressed up in like a, I mean, I still wear like woolen socks in my green Crocs. And you know, like I still, you know, I mean, I don't really make an effort, but I feel sexy. And I feel like this is when I am going to meet someone. Cause like it's, that's the, the perfect place to meet someone is in the grocery shop, right? It's a perfect place. And it would be so easy to be like, Oh, sorry, can you help me reach that? Or like, oh, I love those pasta things or <laughs> whatever. So I'm always just like walking around the grocery shop for like way too long, just being like, oh, this is like, this is my time out. <laughs> my time out getting ready to meet people. Um, and I think if it doesn't happen in St. Therese, it'll never happen for me. And I'm also very okay with that. Um, Holly Bellew comments, I'm pretty sure I've seen that professional cuddlers are a thing for this reason. I would love to know if that's an actual thing. Because I've also heard about these professional cuddlers. Um, and <laughs> when you Google uh, prof professional cuddler, the first thing that comes up is salary. So people have definitely <laughs> considered becoming a professional cuddler. Um, oh, wow. There's a website called Cuddle Professionals International. Uh, you can get worldwide training, certification, and... Uh, like to become a professional cuddler. Wow, that is more of a thing than I thought it would be. I mean, or at least it has a, it has a website. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean it's not just uh, one man uh, being a bit creepy. Um, no, it's a thing. Book a professional cuddler in London today. That is so interesting. You can book a pro, you can chat online with our cuddlers. Oh, and then there's photos of them. Oh, they're all women. Why was I imagining them? Why was I imagining men? This is so interesting. Okay, so I'm currently looking at cuddlecomfort.com. And I don't know, I think I was 
assuming it would be men. <laughs> but it's like professional women who are cuddlers. Now, I guess what I'm now wondering if is if the uh, clients are men or women. This is very interesting. Uh, I would love to speak to one of these people. Someone says here, here for COVID safe cuddles only. I'm not sure that exists. Um, good conversation is always a bonus. Uh, this person is called Lucky Jade, uh, who's 60 pounds an hour. Um, can meet as a guest in her home or in public. She's 44. Um, so weird. It says like location, height, body type. Drinks, smokes, ethnicity, religion, or children. That feels a bit more like a dating site kind of question, doesn't it? It seems, uh, she also writes, it seems a lot of men on here are looking for more than cuddles. Uh, you're in the wrong place. There's other sites you can go to. Please don't waste my time with it. I can imagine that, right? You can imagine a man booking a professional cuddler and being like, oh, <laughs> ooh, well, now we're here. Why not? Do, do, do. Which would... Oh, it would piss me off if I was a professional cuddler. Um, very interesting. Okay. Oh, this is amazing. Fringes, Shannon says, I know, I know a professional cuddler who is a femme and they do parties and gatherings in the Bay Area. More power to them. Like cuddling gathering? Cuddle gatherings? Because that sounds amazing. And also, in my personal life, or like my personal <laughs> brain, it feels um, kind of uh, scary, which is interesting. Um, uh, uh, um. Oh, Sadie Cashmore says, lockdown was really hard on me for that reason. My partners live in Canada and I had no physical contact for almost two years. Thought I wasn't a touchy person, but then went without any for too long. Yeah. I um, did have some physical contact with someone um, very briefly for like like once or twice during um, the pandemic. And I, I was like, I was basically like a cat that hadn't been touched. <laughs> like just, I was like um, just draping myself around him. Like... If he was like stroking my back, I'd just be like, oh yeah, <laughs> like I couldn't, it was like I couldn't get enough just like basic touch and I felt very silly, but I shouldn't have because it's super normal. Um, <laughs> Holly Value says it's on brand for men. Yeah. And we're talking about them going onto cuddling sites and being like, hey, <laughs> uh, we're back to the more dating aspect. Simon says, I'm only going to the supermarket on Fridays and to the cinema. So for two years, I get dressed on Fridays, do my eye makeup, and wear an amazing outfit just to see people with buying food and to post on Instagram. Yeah. Hard relate. Hard relate. Hard relate. <laughs> um, Jennifer Sutton says, not quite on a meeting people level, but my only in-person event these days is a monthly queer book group, and I use that as my chance to dress up and show off outfits. Is that a physical, like, uh, meet in real life meeting? Or is it like a Zoom virtual book group? Because it sounds amazing. I, so what, I'm going to tell you about this thing that I've been doing to some extent of success. I have joined a, I, I don't know if you'd call it a dating app, really, called Field, F-E-E-L-D. And Field is, um... I guess like Tinder, but for kinky, polyamorous, queer. It's it looks like it's like basically lefty, anything out of the ordinary kind of thing, and I don't even remember why I signed up, but I did. And the app in itself is really shit. Like it crashes all the time. It's super annoying. But I was in shock. I am telling you, these profiles. There were, like, men saying, like, uh, I am not here for a one-night stand. I want, like, actual connection and conversation. 
and like it's super important to talk about boundaries and I kind of want to know what your boundaries are and I'm currently looking into like a poly type of relationship because I need to be working on myself and I was like what is this what is happening (laughs) do do these people exist this is weird and uh, I've spoken to a few people there like I'm very it's not that I'm picky I'm just very careful I think and I um spoke to one person who turned out to be a fan um where I was just like sorry that's that's too weird for me but thank you like I just that puts me in a weird place and I don't know how to deal with that but thank you Uh, and they were super hard and nice and all of that so that was fun and then there was one who I'm gonna say there were orange flags one was that they knew who I was but they weren't like they didn't seem as a fan so I was like okay that's okay um then when I googled his name like all these articles came up about basically someone with the same name being a bit of a murderer uh and I was like joking with him like ha 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 what's this is this you and he was like ha yeah right and I was like no really I'm gonna need you to say that it's definitely not you and he never said that so is that an orange flag is that a red flag am I gonna die um and then there was the fact that and now this is a whole other thing that we can discuss next Sunday but um at one point it took him a few days to get back to me and when he did he was like oh I've I've started having these panic attacks now which is just like perfect timing like so annoying Uh, so sorry that's why I wasn't there and it was part of me that felt like hmm I don't know why this feels like at least an orange flag I don't know does it feel a bit like am I going to be responsible for your mental health kind of thing or am I just being oversensitive anyways and then I spoke to someone that I actually wanted to meet who was like in a poly relationship just seeking some fun just wanting to like date and get to know people and I was like I could meet this person in a bar and have a drink and like that would be one of my first like what my third ever date in my whole life um but I also thought he was local turns out he's not he's like an hour away and then I'm like oh I think that's too far for me to like that's a whole hour on the tube where I'm gonna be panicking because I'm gonna meet a real life person but overall I highly recommend field I really do that I, I there are fewer people than there are on like hinge and tinder and stuff but the people who are there are like spectacular I think, at least in London. Um, <laughs> Shannon very rightly comments uh, uh, the the emoji that does that sort of awkward smile, and says, "Just for the not confirming, he's not a murderer." Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm assuming he's not, but you know, <laughs> you never know. Um, oh, for Caitlin. Oh, I don't remember seeing a Caitlin, so I'm not really sure. Jennifer Sutton says, I'm Polly. Oh, is that what, is that the name of your book club? Jennifer, sorry. Now Google for Caitlin. Caitlin. Sorry, that confused me. Um... Jennifer Sutton I'm, uh, says, I'm poly and that helps me negotiate all my relationships, friends, family, which friends are happy to snuggle, hold hands, so affection doesn't come primarily from romantic partners, which is also interesting, right? It's like this idea of being alone or like alone or in a relationship. There's also like this little bit where you just have a lot of friends and people to hang out with and people to touch with and whatever it is. But again... Um, Saima says, a travel show with a comedian attended a cuddle or touch therapy event in a country like Thailand. Everyone lay down on the ground and was physically close to everyone else. Saima, if you remember what comedian that was, that would give me a very good idea of... Caitlin was the voice message. Oh, sorry. Yes, that is because Caitlin um, was spelled in a in a extremely different way than... <laughs> 
than in the common. I'm sorry, so I didn't make the connection. Yes, that the common from Jennifer Sutton about uh, being Polly uh, was for Caitlin, the original voice note person. So, uh, and Jennifer Sutton also says, my queer book group is in person. We've been going for three years, so we all trust each other to be safe and they're all fantastic. Jennifer, that sounds amazing. Uh, it is now 11.29 and we've come to the end of this first ever blabbermouth. I am so excited about this. What have we learned? We have learned that I think this works. This is a lot of fun. Um, I had not even considered how fun it could be to just like reach out to people during the show and ask if they wanted to come on and share their wisdom um, like we could with Bethany. That's so cool. Uh, so a huge thank you to Bethany uh, and Justine for jumping on uh, with such short notice. Um, we've learned that I need to do something about the sun in my eyes because um, I'm going to say that's not ideal. <laughs> it's actually very annoying. Uh, I should have known, some would say. Oh, if you want to do good videos, you have to be in sunlight. <laughs> Turns out, no. Um, and I think this works. And I think this has been so much fun. And I am just really excited that you wanted to be a part of this uh, first one, this experiment. I feel like doing a, another one next week. Maybe even one before that. I don't know. I'm kind of obsessed with this. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, you can leave uh, voice notes on sophiehagen.com forward slash blabbermouth, B-L-A-B-B-E-R-M-O-U-T-H. Uh, and I hope that you will all have a wonderful Sunday. Uh, and <laughs> uh, we've got Rachel saying, I'm so stoked that you did this at this time because it's 7 p.m. here in Sydney. Normally when you do these interactive things, I have to be <laughs> wake up, I have to wake up at 4 a.m. And then we've got Holly saying, haha, Rachel, I woke up at 5 a.m. <laughs> this is what is this is what this this is what makes us so beautiful. We've got people from East Coast US, we've got people in Australia, we've got people who are 44 we've got a child who's 21 we've got a writer we've got poly people we've got like this is all oh thank you so much for being part of this uh, i hope to see you next time i will send out a newsletter with the information and keep an eye out on patreon and yeah tell me your thoughts uh and if you have any ideas of what it was missing or what you uh yeah just do you know what just thank you.